Through studying monochromatic painting, we are convinced that the most important aspect in oil painting is the element of values. In addition to learning about values, we have also learned about edges and texture. Now we'll integrate these three elements to the last and very interesting element of color. Every technique consists in increasing or decreasing any of these four elements. In other words, lightening or darkening the value, softening or hardening the edge, increasing or decreasing the texture or changing the color. Let's review some of the concepts you learned in part one of this course with quick examples of the three properties of color, hue, value and intensity. This color has an orange hue, this one a green hue, this one a reddish violet hue, this one a darker value hue, this a lighter value. This one a high intensity red hue with a half value. And this one a low intensity greenish hue with a light half value. Complementary colors. The gray colors. Color temperature in their contrasts. Since we already know that what's most important in oil painting is the distribution of values, then what's more logical than to learn how to lighten and darken colors? There are several ways to lighten and darken colors, but the method used will depend on whether you are a tonalist or a colorist artist. I'll talk more about this later. Now, I must say the following, before you see what happens to colors in nature. The tonalist movement is the oldest. It uses the value instead of the color as the dominant structure in the painting. That is, it places emphasis on the contrast to values. The colorist movement began with French Impressionism in the second half of the 19th century. In it, the values are somewhat sacrificed to give greater importance to the variety of colors. The values are considered as color assistants. In this course, we will use ideas from both of these methods to lighten and darken colors. In nature, when a color gets lighter or darker, its hue changes at the same time. To lighten or darken a color in your painting you can follow the transitions of the color wheel, instead of lightening the colors with white and darkening them with black. For example, Cadmium yellow light has a warm, very light value. When lightening yellow, it becomes a lemon yellow, or a mixture of yellow with a hint of green and white. To make it even lighter, add some more white. The green color can be mixed with cadmium yellow light, and very little follow blue and white. Be aware, that follow blue has a strong tinting power. You may use yellow ochre, instead of a green color. Yellow ochre has a similar cool color as lemon yellow. When darkening cadmium yellow light, it first turns to a half value orange, 
and then to a red violet. Start by mixing yellow and a little cadmium red light, and as it gets darker, add alizarin crimson, and lastly burn umber if even darker. Orange is a mixture of a little cadmium red light and more cadmium yellow light. Lighten the orange color with white and cadmium yellow light. For a darker orange, add more cadmium red and a little alizarin crimson. The darkest value may be mixed with less red and more alizarin. You may add a little burnt umber to the darkest value. When the red color gets lighter, it may turn towards an orange hue. You should lighten the red with a mixture of a little cadmium yellow light and white. When the red darkens, it first takes on a purplish red hue, and then a purplish blue. To make this transition, first add a little alizarin crimson, then a mixture of alizarin and ultramarine blue. You may add a little burnt umber to make the darkest value. It's possible to darken the red color with a bit of its complementary color, green. Do not add too much green because it would gray the red color. Alizarin crimson is a reddish violet. In order to obtain a bluish violet, you should add a little ultramarine blue. Any violet color can be lightened with white. Any violet may be darkened with ultramarine blue. You can also darken the violet color even more, with a mixture of ultramarine blue and burnt umber. When the blue color lightens, it turns towards a cool, greenish blue like the thalo blue. You can add white to lighten the thalo blue. As the blue color darkens, it gradually becomes a warm blue violet. The blue color changes to an ultramarine blue, and finally to a mixture of this blue and alizarin crimson. This mixture gets dark enough without having to add any other color. A mixture of cadmium yellow light and thalo blue will produce a cooler and more intense green than if you were to mix cadmium yellow light and ultramarine blue. You can lighten either green with a little more cadmium yellow light and white. You can darken the green color with a little more of the blue you use to mix the green color. You can also darken it with its complementary color, which is cadmium red. Do not add too much red for you would gray the green. You must be aware that when using white in a mixture to lighten a color, say in the lightest side of an object, it also grays the color. Almost never, use pure white. Mix it with any color, as it looks flat by itself. For a highlight, mix white with very little, of the complementary color of the object, or subject's local color. Shadows should be chromatic. In other words, they must show some color, even if very dark, never grayish. 
There are three ways to kill the life of a color in the shadows. Number one, by mixing complementary colors in amounts which neutralize each other. When mixing complementary colors one of them must prevail, unless you want to end up with a grayish color. Number 2, adding white to the color of the shadows. And number 3, adding too much black. Black tends to kill the life of the colors, and should only be used as a local color, and even then, never by itself. You can mix black colors with burnt umber and either ultramarine blue, or thalo blue in different proportions to obtain cool, or warm black colors. These guidelines are general observations. You should not paint anything in isolation, to the rest of the painting you are working on. You should always consider the influence of the color of the light source, and the colors of nearby objects, which may be reflected on the object that you're painting. Each object you observe is subject to the unique color circumstances of the moment. The color theory cannot replace personal observation. The colors you see on any object depends not only on its local color, but the color of the light source, and the colors reflected from nearby objects. Look at the three lemons on the left. They are illuminated by a warm light, while the lemons on the right are illuminated by a cool light. Notice the influence of the light on the color of the lemons. The warm light gives an orange hue to the lemons, while the cool light gives the lemons a bluish hue. However, there is color harmony in each of these images, because of the corresponding temperature of the light. Therefore, the colors you mix should correspond to the temperature of the light illuminating the objects. If the light is warm, such as an orange color from an incandescent light, or the afternoon sunlight, then the colors of the objects are influenced by such orange color. If the light source is cool, like the bluish light from fluorescent lamps, or the morning sunlight, then the colors of the objects are influenced by such bluish color. Of course, the artist is free to dramatize, or exaggerate colors by contrasting them against each other, as long as the final work looks harmonious. Many artists like to emphasize the aspect of temperature of light on objects, by painting the shadows with a mixture of the object's local color, and the light's complementary color. This way the painting gets a chromatic drama. Such artists tend to be colorists. Observe these very simplified schemes with several ways to paint a red cube. The cube at the upper left is being illuminated by a warm light. So, the colorist artist would probably lighten the red color in the light with an orange color and white, and would darken the red color in the shadow with the light's complementary color, a violet or blue.
The cube at the lower left is illuminated by a cool light. The colorist artist would probably lighten the red color in the light with violet or blue, and white, while he would darken the red color in the shadow, with the light's complementary color, orange and burnt umber. Conversely, when the artist decides to paint lights and shadows with lighter or darker versions, very close to the object's local colors, then the artist tends to be a tonalist. A tonalist would probably paint a cube such as the one shown to the right, by lightening the red color with yellow and white in the light, and darkening the shadow with a darker version of the red, possibly with alizarin crimson, though it tends towards a reddish violet. Notice the green background which is the red's complementary color. Between the pure colorist and tonalist, there are many ways to solve the problem of lightening and darkening colors. But the color scheme you choose should always be one that's harmonious, according to the light source. Covering an area with a single color having no value, hue, or intensity variation is boring, and anti-aesthetic. It's more fun, and interesting to use different hues of the same value. To get the effect of vibration of two colors in a particular area, first paint that area with the object's local color. Then, mix any other color on your palette of the same value, and make small brush strokes over the local color with little pressure while both colors are wet, and without disturbing too much the color underneath. If this second color is a color similar in temperature to the first, the vibration will be soft. If the two colors are complementary, or opposite temperatures, the vibration will be stronger. In both cases the vibration will be harmonious because the two colors have the same value. The way you organize the colors in your palette is something personal. But, since you already know that the distribution of values in a painting is most important, it follows that you should consider a similar distribution in your palette. Until the mid-19th century, most artists tended to use a pre-mixed palette before painting. Colors were mixed beforehand, and placed in the palette according to their value. The tonal advantage of the premixed palette lends itself to an orderly and controlled learning because the artist, after evaluating the values and hues, can more easily select the corresponding mixture. Any mixture is made from a particular line with colors of the same value, so as not to change the value of the resulting color mixture. Certainly, such a palette is very limited. Sooner or later the artist realizes the restrictions of its possibilities. When using the premixed palette, much paint is also wasted, for it is difficult to anticipate which color mixtures, and how much of each will be needed in your work session. Most artists use an open palette where each color is mixed as needed. 
Mixing the colors you need, as you paint, is easy for the artist with some practical experience. In addition, this type of palette lends itself more to the motifs and moods of the artist, rather than the opposite with the rigidity of a premixed palette. The open palette can take various forms, depending on the artist's taste. We will now focus on the method of mixing colors on the open palette. You already learned how to place the basic colors on our palette. Most likely, you noticed that some of the colors came out of the tube as easily as butter or mayonnaise, while others are not as manageable, and require mixing them with a few drops of the medium. Before beginning to paint, you should have all the colors with more or less the same consistency. As I said, in an open palette you should mix the colors as needed while painting. This is the most efficient way. You must make a habit of taking the colors you need from the border of your basic palette and placing them in the middle of your palette next to each other leaving a small space in between them. When you need a particular hue, you should take an amount from each of these colors, and mix them in the middle with your brush. Always leave a trail of the shades leading to the original colors. This way you can select any shade in between, and also have the original colors available for more mixing. For example, if you need several shades of green, you can place one amount of yellow, and another of blue next to each other. Then, move the brush in between, picking some of the yellow and blue colors. You will mix a green in the center, while having a yellowish green to one side, and a bluish green on the other side. You can lighten any of these, by putting some white below these shades of green, and moving the brush towards the white. Or you can darken them by putting some burn number above, and moving the brush in that direction. Remember to leave some of the original colors, so you can modify the hues whenever you need to. Say, you want to paint this still life. In this composition we have a watermelon, a pitcher and various fruits in front of violet, and yellow backdrops. In the last lesson, you practiced painting with the five values in a monochromatic way, and already understand the importance of the initial structure using dark colors, especially in the shadows and dark objects. You also learn to squint your eyes, in order to simplify the values, and see the objects like a map or a jigsaw puzzle. This helps establish the locations, and sizes of the watermelon, the pitcher, fruits and folds of the backdrops. The forms of such simplification can be different with each artist, but its essence is the same. Some artists like to work on a toned canvas covered with a very thin mixture of a dark color and turpentine, but this is not absolutely necessary when working with colors. At this stage, I like to mix a somewhat dark tone of blue, with burnt umber, and ultramarine blue, so I don't prematurely commit to any color. But this is a personal matter. 
How much detail you add with this dark thin mixture before starting with colors is also a personal matter. But it is natural that as you gain skill and experience you will want to start much earlier. To get an idea of the process of mixing the colors, we use the two mangoes on the far left. The mango on the left has an overall halftone, of a yellowish green hue, and the one on the right has an overall orange hue, also of a halftone. But this, is a very superficial glance. Let's look more closely at the mango on the left. It has an orange hue on the upper area. Not only this, but its greenish hue gets more and more yellowish in some areas, and dark green in its local shadow, as it hides from the light coming from the left. It also catches some violet reflected from the fabric below. It also has an orange reflection from its neighbor mango. Finally, it has a strong highlight, where the light shines on it directly. This highlight has a soft edge, as the light spills over to the right, towards the mango's dip closest to us. The mango on the right also has similar subtleties, which should be observed carefully as we mix the right colors. One issue that always comes up, during the process of watching a painting demonstration, is that we find it difficult to follow exactly which colors were mixed and applied to a particular area, because we have to quickly change our view from the artist palette to the painting, and back to the palette. I will separate the two showing both, the color mixing process, and the area where the colors are applied, pointing out the particular colors used. You must ask yourself, which colors to use, and where to place them on your palette in order to make an easier mixing procedure? First, let's see the colors needed on your palette, while at the same time we'll see their arrangement in a graph on the bottom right. This will give you one good idea of how to proceed. For the mango having an average halftone orange hue, you should place cadmium yellow light next to cadmium red light on our palette, so we could mix various orange hues, some leaning towards yellow and others towards red. While mixing these two colors, be aware that the yellow color is usually much weaker and less opaque than the red color. In other words, the red color can easily overpower the yellow color. Put some ultramarine blue next to the cadmium yellow light, and mix them a bit to achieve two, or three green hues. Now, 
Pick up much white, and place it below the green hues. Between the green hues and white you can mix green hues of lighter values. Get some burnt umber and put it above the green hues. Between the green hues and burnt umber you can mix green hues of darker values. Put some alizarin crimson below and to the side of the cadmium red light. Between alizarin and red you can mix various dark red hues. While mixing the appropriate hues, I realized that I needed more cadmium yellow light. Yellow, is a rather weak color. So, I picked up an additional amount of yellow and put it in the same original place. Put a little more burnt umber above, where you mix the orange hues. This way you can mix darker versions of the orange hue. I thought appropriate to add some more red to the burnt umber, to achieve a dark red tone for the mango's local shadow. You can also darken the red hue, with dark green and even ultramarine blue. It depends on the temperature of the red color you want. Finally, put some more white below, where you mix the orange hues. With this white you can lighten the orange hues. Remember that this procedure only represents a general idea of organizing the colors on your palette. It doesn't mean you have to always use this same arrangement. Specific colors change, according to what you are painting. What doesn't change is the general procedure of mixing the colors on your palette. In other words, the logic of this method is to have the colors in adjacent places so you can easily find and mix the appropriate colors. As you gain confidence with this system, you can improve upon it through the selective mixing of complementary colors. For example, you could mix red and green of the same value to achieve certain vibrations, providing the correct hue prevails. This mixture could be done directly on the canvas. If you first decide to make the mixture on your palette before applying it to the canvas, be careful not to mix them thoroughly. I will cover this subject in part 4 of this course. You should also avoid mixing several colors together, without having an idea of the specific color you want. If an original color is depleted, you should replenish it immediately.
To avoid unwanted color contamination on your brushes, especially when colors are of different temperature or values, I recommend that you start using at least two medium brushes size number six. Say, one brush for lighter values, and one for darker ones. Brushes should be cleaned with a rag, or paper towel before changing colors of temperatures or values. After you develop more skill with the brush, you will realize the need to use more brushes, so in addition to having brushes for light and dark values, you can have brushes for cool and warm temperatures. You will learn more quickly, if at first you paint on a canvas not larger than 12 by 16 inches. What you learn in a painting, can be applied towards the next one faster than if you were to paint on a much larger canvas. You will also feel a greater satisfaction, as you finish several paintings faster. The following demonstration explains how to paint with the colors of your basic palette, while showing the most important fundamentals of oil painting. It will go over everything learned so far in this course. You should practice these fundamentals for some time in order of difficulty with still life, then some landscapes, and finally a self-portrait. Memorizing these fundamentals is fine, but it is the consistency of your practice, painting as often as you can that you will determine your development and understanding of the fundamentals. This is most important. We'll now see the procedure of painting the two mangoes of the still life. I cover the local shadows of the two mangoes with a thin layer of an earth color like burnt umber, mixed with a bit of ultramarine blue. But it could be almost any low intensity, dark earth color. I know that later, I will have to adjust it with the red violet color, as light reflected from the fabric below the green mango. Of course, I don't want this dark value to compete with the green and orange colors of the mangoes. This has to do with the principle of hierarchy. If all colors looked important the painting would cause confusion. I also covered the remaining two mangoes with very thin layers of preliminary, averaged halftone colors, one green, and one orange-yellow. Both of these colors are also, applied very thinly and not so high in intensity, because I just want to make a simple and general base for subsequent layers. When a surface is covered with thin paint and subtle brush pressure, the paint becomes a bit transparent, and gets influenced by the color of the surface which lies below. This can be done sometimes, when you don't wish to cover the surface of the canvas completely, leaving for later the thicker paint layers. I also applied a thin layer of low intensity, orange hue in the upper side of the green mango. I sometimes squint my eyes and see the colors of the mango like a map, or a jigsaw puzzle. I applied another thin, yellowish layer of paint in the area just below the orange hue.
I see a greenish hue, darker and less intense on the right side, in the local shadow of the green mango. I mix this hue with cadmium yellow, ultramarine blue and a very small amount of burnt umber. Burnt umber darkens and lowers the intensity of the yellowish-green hue. I make a soft, preliminary edge from this greenish, darker value to a yellowish-green of a lighter value on the left, where the light hits the mango. I make the edges of the mango with a cooler green. These edges look more bluish green because they are farther from us than the center of the mango. For the fruit to display some volume, the center of the mango should have a warmer hue. Remember that the colors closer to us look more intense and warmer, while the colors that are farther from us look less intense and cooler. So, I mix a yellowish green with cadmium yellow, and a smaller amount of ultramarine blue. If you have forgotten the lessons on color temperature and edges, you can review the color theory in part 1 of this course. I start working on the light of the green mango. There, the green hue is more yellowish and its value is lighter. I apply thicker paint to add some texture and make it more sculptural. Sometimes, I add some orange color of the same value as the yellow-green color to get some vibration. The French Impressionist taught us this technique. An object's surface usually looks too flat and boring when painted with just one uniform color. With little experience you will notice different values and hues when looking at any surface, depending on the color of the light source and nearby objects. I'm joining all the pieces of the jigsaw puzzle with soft edges, so they form a whole. I keep refining all the orange, green, bluish green and yellowish green hues with soft edges. The edges where the shape of the mango ends and the violet fabric begins are firmer but never hard, as the fruit's topography is curved back. I work on the top of the mango, adding more yellow and white paint to the green hue already there, to make it lighter. I keep working smaller, and smaller details as I finish painting the green mango. Now, I make the local shadow with a dark, bluish green and burnt umber. I join this dark shape to the lighter one on the left with a soft edge. The edge on the lower side of the local shadow is firmer. I refine the cast shadow with a dark color mixed with ultramarine blue, alizarin crimson, and burnt umber. Since, these colors were not adjacent on the color arrangement on my palette, I needed to make the mixture for the cast shadow, on a separate space on my palette. I 
I start working on the base of the highlight with a half-light value of a yellow hue, preparing it for the much lighter value, where the light hits the mango. I'm still refining the edges, and temperature changes in the same way I've done so far, increasing the volume of the fruit, while adding a bit of texture where the light hits the fruit. I sometimes drag my brush around the highlight, to make softer edges between the lightest part, and its surrounding areas. I mix warmer shadows with an orange-red hue. With practice, you can apply brush strokes with one color over another which is still wet, and know beforehand the resulting hue. It's similar to mixing colors on your palette. So, you can mix colors directly on the canvas, as well as on your palette. I keep softening the edges between the dark fabric background and the mango while I look for a color relationship between the orange and the green colors below. I also continue to improve the shape of the fruit. Notice how the mango already looks like having a certain volume. This is due, not only to the light values in the light, and dark values in the local shadow, but to aerial perspective. In this regard, I have been putting a warmer and intense yellowish green, combined with the much lighter value of the highlight on the nearer side of the mango, and placing cooler bluish green hues on the mango's upper border, even when this border has an orangish hue. The volume is also due to the softer edges where the shape of the mango ends. Aerial perspective has to do with the effect of the atmosphere on the appearance of an object, related to its distance to the observer. Although, in this still life all objects are at similar distances to us, we can exaggerate aerial perspective to enhance on this effect. We can play with the intensity, or chroma of the mango's local color, its color temperature, the contrast of its values, or tones and its blurred, or defined edges.
The colors of more distant shapes lose some of their intensity, while the colors of objects that are closer to us appear more intense. That is, the temperature of the colors is cooler and grayer the further away the shapes are from the observer. Another way that distance affects the color of shapes is in their tone or value. The values of the colors tend toward the half value as the shapes recede. A shape with a light value loses some of its light tone and a shape with a dark tone loses its dark tone. In other words, the difference in value decreases with distance. Less contrast of value is seen as shapes recede. The contrast of values and colors is less as the distance from the front shape of the mango to its back shape increases. And finally, the shapes look more defined when they are closer to us and more blurred or diffused when they are further away. Details are less noticeable at a distance. Edges are harder when close and softer when far away. I work the other mango with an orange hue, fixing its shape at the top. I make the cool edges where the light hits it with a mixture of orange, a bit of blue and then another bit of white. Since blue is the complementary color of orange, it lowers its intensity and cools the orange color. Blue has a darker value than orange. So, a bit of white is needed to lighten the mixture and make it similar to the value of the orange color.
I worked the violet fabric a bit with alizarin crimson. It has a lighter value where the objects rest, than the part that falls vertically. I can't help my usual concept of increasing the chiaroscuro drama in my paintings, and will paint the two fabric backdrops much darker in value than they actually are. This will increase the value contrast, especially against the very light value of the picture. I paint the orange mango's local shadow, with a dark half value, mixing cadmium red and alizarin crimson. I work the edge, where the local shadow of the orange mango begins with a mixture of cadmium red and burnt umber. As is always the case, the value here is darker than the area below, where there is a reflected light from the violet fabric. I paint a dark red in the local shadow, on the right side of the mango, knowing that on top of that dark color, I'm going to drag the brush gently with a green hue of a slightly lighter tone, to put the reflected light of the green watermelon. Learning skills like this one are important, because you learn the proper brush pressure and to vibrate colors of opposite temperatures.
I mix the orange color that I see on the mango, and I apply it to see if it harmonizes with the other mango. I paint a thin layer of the generalized, averaged orange color that I see where the light hits the mango. I am mainly thinking of two things. The value of the orange color, and the area that this color occupies separated from the local shadow. This is the fundamental process that is followed before making changes to the topography. That is, changes in hue, value, temperature, intensity, and texture. Working on these subtleties is learned over time, but establishing the two areas of light and shadow is the most important. I place a bit of highlight with white, and almost no ultramarine blue or thalo blue, the complementary color of orange. Many times, the highlight turns out to be a very light tone of the complementary color to the surface the highlight is on. I adjust the edges of the highlight, looking for some vibration. I keep adjusting the shape and edges of the orange mango by dragging my brush with a little bit of the orange color on top of the cool color that I had already put on the edges. It is important to know when to stop after obtaining the desired effect. I put a little orange color to the other mango to harmonize both mangoes. All objects in a painting should be made to harmonize with each other. That is, they should have some common feature. This imparts a certain unity to the whole painting. Otherwise, the objects would be disconnected from each other, creating discomfort when observing the painting.
I keep fixing the edges. I worked some details that I see in the center of the mango where the light hits it. Here I see yellows, dark greens and strong contrasts, that is, quite interesting hard edges. When I see these details, I think of good opportunities to show off my painting by looking for the topography of the forms. Each artist has his own preferences. I make the fruit more reddish on the left side, and a soft edge between this color and its more purplish local shadow. I put some yellowish green of the same value as the orange color, to add interest, and to harmonize it with the general hue of the other mango. I place the highlight again and adjust its edge.
I make the mango more reddish where I see it with this hue. I continue to refine, by dragging my brush between hues and values, but without disturbing their differences. This is very important, otherwise it would ruin all my previous work. As you have seen, each brush stroke has a well-defined purpose. Either putting a color that occupies a certain area in particular, darkening or lightening the value of an area, adjusting an edge between hues or values, making it softer or harder, or adding texture by thickening the paint especially in very light tones where the light hits. As a summary, you play with the four elements of the technique that are the values, the edges, the textures and the colors.
Sometimes, I move my brush between one hue and another, controlling the pressure of the brush to change only the area that I wish to change. This requires much attention to what is being done. The value and hue change as one varies the pressure of the brush. With less pressure, only the upper layer of the paint is affected and with a higher pressure the lower layer is allowed to be seen. In this demonstration, you have seen the importance of knowing how to handle the four elements, as well as how the colors that are needed, are mixed and applied. Proper brush pressure when handling these elements, is also important to obtain the desired technique. Now, you can see the final result of the brush strokes using these four elements. You should study the subtleties in the color intensity changes, their temperatures, their complementary colors and the vibration of some colors against others. Note the play of green hues and orange hues, particularly on the local shadow, with soft transitions between one another. These brush strokes, which appear to have occurred by accidents, give the painting some looseness and naturalness. These qualities occur primarily due to the almost total absence of hard edges. Each artist must decide the amount of hard edges to be included in the painting. Notice the transition of the edges around the highlight on the mango. They make the highlight part of the object, and not floating over and disconnected from the object. The edges of the fruit look cool and blurred, with quite a bit of atmosphere. While the center of the orange mango captures our greatest attention, as it occupies in a hierarchy of opposites, the hardest edges, the greatest contrast of values, the greatest contrast of colors, that is, complementary colors, and the greatest amount of details. Don't forget that to a lesser or greater extent, oil painting is always subject to trial and error. Don't be afraid to invent, change, add, or adjust shapes, values, and colors. It is during this process that you find your particular tastes and preferences, while inventing your own techniques. Observe the texture in the places where the light falls directly on the pitcher, that is, the belly and the handle. Not even on a white object like this pitcher did I use pure white paint. I vibrated the white with orange hues and a greenish yellow. In addition to breaking the monotony of white, these colors echo the colors of the mangoes and watermelon, unifying the entire still life. I also used the other end of the brush to add more texture on the pitcher with certain curves. You can also make these marks with the spatula or any other object that you consider convenient. All this activity with slightly warm colors contrasts with the cool bluish colors of the body of the pitcher. As you have seen, much of the key to success in your painting depends on how you incorporate opposites in values, complementary colors, temperature, intensity, asymmetry, and hierarchy of details.
Also notice, that the cast shadow from the handle of the pitcher is not black, but has a warm reddish color. This gives life and a certain appeal to the cast shadow. Always make sure your painting looks chromatic and beautiful, without being overloaded with all the colors of the rainbow. The violet fabric background is much less intense behind the pitcher's handle, it is grayer and cooler than the objects in front. This is due to aerial perspective, the atmospheric effect. The rest of the fruit in the bottom of the pitcher, remain more blurred with less detail, so as not to distract from the main subjects. This responds to the principle of hierarchy. The top edge of the green watermelon has a cool, bluish edge, so its shape goes back. Observe the warm light reflected by the reddish-violet fruit, in the local shadow, on the bottom edge of the watermelon, as well as the reflected light from the pitcher on the right side of the watermelon. The greenish-yellow highlight of the watermelon, makes its dark stripes look fuzzy in that area. Notice the small part of the highlight, where the light hits the watermelon directly. There, the highlight turns light yellow and mixes with the light orange hue to echo and harmonize with the orange mango. It has been around 6 or 7 hours of painting, and I am finally satisfied. According to my taste and concept, I have greatly darkened the background values of the violet and yellow fabrics to create a chiaroscuro drama. It is important to know our preferences. In other words, what really impresses or excites us. This feeling or concept is truly what guides us to invent, or discover the technique that suits our taste. That is, following certain principles of aesthetics. As I have been explaining, these principles have to do with the hierarchy of opposites.